I once heard a metaphor that our existence is like standing behind a curtain with tears or holes and reality becomes which holes we decide to look through when we're peering out at the world on the other side. What do we want to see? And this message, well, it's for whoever out there feels like giving up or folding their hands. Whoever's been waiting for things to change but only sees the clock moving forward, this is a reminder that the very thing you need is on the other side of that curtain. And you don't need to change who you are. You just need to position yourself to see it. Because it's there and you're ready. When life hurts, we might have every reason to be in pain to feel lost or confused, but I always find it to be a beautiful reminder that we also have every reason to seek out from that pain something we've never been before. Why is it that our greatest accomplishments come when our backs are to the wall? Our greatest acquisitions after losing something dear to us? Why is it that we find ourselves in our way only after being lost? I've never heard someone say, thank God I never changed or left or tried something new. No, it's thank God the adversity forced upon me the courage to evolve into something more. Pain is to our potential what water is to a seed. It's the beginning of everything, unshackling, opening the gate and making us realize we were sitting on the answers that adversity doesn't stop you, it makes you stronger. That the down times lift you up. That when you lose yourself, you find a part of you that can now become the bridge to your future. See, I understand that things are difficult and challenging. I understand they're not easy and I'm not asking you to pretend it's not happening or ignore it or close your eyes. I'm asking you to find amidst all of this, that one thing, one thing that will get you to tomorrow. I'm asking you to find the courage to say, yes, this hurts. Yes, I'm stretched thinner than I've ever been, but I'm still going to find a way. I'm still going to make it happen. Because at the end of the day, you won't remember what hurt or what stood in your way. But you'll remember what you did about it. You'll remember how you arranged those pieces. How when your instincts said run, you stopped and built something you'll never forget. It all starts with a thought. You didn't ask for it. You never wanted it, but it's here. And now the game has changed. Because that thought is not your friend. It's not telling you how strong you are or reminding you that you always find a way. No, it's informing you that you're finished. Tired weak, chanting that you'll get them tomorrow, kid. Softly at first, then a little louder and a little louder until the message becomes unmistakable. And in this moment, it's not your legs that become vulnerable. It's not your lungs. This situation transcends the physical. You are in the ring with your mind. This is when the gloves come off. It's fight or flight, and in your gut, you know it's nothing more than a front, intimidation. Life's way of separating the average from the exceptional, but this is not about knowing the truth. It's about having the courage to stand up to it. Because that voice is continuously showing you your distress, your pain, your fatigue. It's pointing to an empty well, telling you that you have nothing left and perhaps in a different universe you'd listen. But in this world, the well always goes deeper. There is always more to give. That moment when you begin to hurt. 
the second that voice pops into your head, you have only given a fraction of your maximum effort. When you meet resistance, your limits haven't even been tested. Obstacles do not make the destination any more or less real. They simply call for an adjustment. So adjust. See, time stops when you stop. Goals stop when you stop. Dreams stop when you stop. And in a world with infinite possibility, there's simply no reason to relinquish that control. So let your forward progress silence the dissenting voices. Let those on the sideline talk about their empty tanks and fantasize limitation. You are not running on empty. My friend, you are simply running. Where is your finish line? What is your maximum effort? Think about that question. What is your indication that you've hit your peak? It's an interesting question because when you look closely, you'll find that there truly is no answer, right? People point to fatigue, being tired. Maybe they're happy with the result but it still leaves the question unanswered. What is your limit? There's no automatic mechanism that shuts us down when we've given everything we have, when we've done all we can do. It's not like a glass of water that reaches the top and overflows. For human potential, think bigger. Think of an ocean. How many buckets of water could you pour into an ocean before it couldn't physically hold any more liquid? What is the number? No one knows exactly. You can stop at a thousand buckets, at a million, at a trillion, but at some point, you'll have poured the last bucket and stopped. And the question remains, at that moment, could you have added one more? That is human potential. It's mind blowing. Every time you thought you've given your all, you were lying to yourself. And not in the sense that you weren't trying hard or what you did wasn't important, but in the sense that you artificially created your own finish line. You determined your stopping point. Not the laws of nature, not some unearthly being, you dictated your limit. I had an old coach who used to reference Roger Bannister. He was the first person to break the four minute mile, a feat that at the time was simply unheard of. So what happens? He accomplishes this goal and suddenly people start doing it all over the world. Rapid fire. In a very short amount of time. Why? Because it became real. People had living proof that it was possible. Four minutes, what is that? It's an artificial stopping point, a self-created limit. It does not exist. Just like the reason you think you can't write the next best-selling book, or the reason you go to a job you hate every day, because you've settled. You've limited your potential without even realizing it. Why would you cut yourself off there? There's so much more to obtain, so much more to achieve, so much waiting. Man, life is just too short to not make the most out of it, to get in the way of your own greatness. Why would you decide to wake up every day and not feel like it was the best gift possible, not take advantage? Why would you limit that for yourself? 
There will be times when you struggle, there will be tough days, there will be times of self-doubt. But let it all fall to the wayside. See past it. Your destiny lies far beyond any self-made wall. Take that with you. There are a few things you just can't learn from a textbook that you have to live through, to see, to be fully entrenched in. Because here is a simple truth. This world is a tough place. Getting what you want, making the most of the time you have requires that you put yourself in the position to succeed. It means you see a finish line before one exists. Look, no one's ever going to call you and tell you how incredible your idea is. You can't build a business on potential or win a championship on promise. Results are binary. You either accomplished something or you simply did not. Right? That's it. That's what people see, the result. So that means every second, every step of the way from where you are right now until you cross the finish line depends on you and your thoughts. How you internalize failure, how you look at setbacks, when no one is around to pat you on the back or tell you how great you are, will you have enough self-belief to move forward? Because my friends, that's the hardest part. That's what no one talks about. Having the courage to wake up every single day of your life and know that you are building towards something incredible. You are creating a masterpiece from the ground up. And that means that when you're looking in the mirror, you believe in what's staring back at you. You see the unseen and you are willing to bring it to life. That is the foundation that you build greatness on. And it's a daily pursuit, creating milestones, designing the small wins that keep you going, that keep you moving, that get you past all those times you so desperately want to turn around, but know that for you, it simply isn't an option. That is not your reality. You have more waiting for you. And so you press on, cloaked in confidence, you move into the unknown, seeking the day the rest of the world looks up and calls you lucky. They'll look at what you built and say how fortunate you are, but they won't comprehend the 20 hour days, the focus, the ridicule for being different or obsessive or non-conformist. They won't know that self-belief trumped all of that that it was everything. The word great is separate for a reason. It implies a specific set of beliefs and values. It means you saw light when most people saw darkness. It means you said yes when most people said no. You move forward when the rest of the world turned around. Believe in your greatness. See it, live it. It is there and you need to know that it's there because it will make all the difference. Your self-belief will define you. I was never a runner until one day in grade school, I got running shoes and decided that I was. I never ran a successful business until I saw myself as an accomplished business owner. See, something I've realized through the years is that we are nothing more than the role we are playing. And every day we are auditioning for a part. I'll never forget years back, listening to some actors doing a, a Q&A session. 
And a film student asked one of them uh, for, for some strategies and approaches to getting into character. And one of the actors who volunteers to answer, he looks down at his feet, looks back up and says, it all starts with the shoes that we wear. Because from the ground up, they define how we carry ourselves, how we feel. They allow us to embody a specific character and sort of move forward taking on that persona. What he had just done was spell out the relationship between identity, the story that we've convinced ourselves we should live by, and the actions that we take. Our lives are defined by the metaphorical shoes we wear. You can only be what you believe you are and you will never believe it until you own it, live it. Even though you haven't identified as something in the past, today is different, the script is new. Just like an actor is not confined to his previous role, why would you be confined to yesterday? that abstract idea we used to, to bundle up recent events and make them tangible just so that they can act like an anchor. Oh, yesterday I couldn't complete my workout, so I'm not a runner. Yesterday I was shy at the conference, so I'm an introvert. Yesterday I failed my math test. I don't do math. Look, my question is, is that right? Is it you? Or are those simply the shoes that you've chosen to wear? The role you were playing, because it never fails. If that's how you think of yourself, that is positively the result you're going to get. Wanting something better, positive change, greatness, it requires more than wishful thinking. It requires a deliberate shift in mindset, a change in character, becoming something new. Maybe you're a millionaire. Maybe you're a millionaire with no money right now. Maybe you're a millionaire with a hell of a lot to learn. But if you don't believe you are right now, at this very moment, you will never be one. People always live up to the image that they have created of themselves, period. How you think of yourself is what you'll get. We are actors. The majority of us playing the same role, the one we played yesterday and the day before and the day before. But if you could just convince yourself to be something new, to wear the shoes, to sing the song and dance the dance, you'll evolve. You'll walk away from the fiction holding you back, just like the elephant tied to the plastic chair. You are not the problem. It's the shoes on your feet and the way that you think about them. And I suspect that it's time for a new role. Your obligation is a simple one. I know it has nothing to do with breaking any records. No miracles here. You don't have to be the first or the best or the greatest. No, those things by themselves are meaningless. You can't perform them. They aren't verbs. They're consequences. Consequences of your much simpler obligation. To not stop. To carry on. To hush your mind and move your feet. No, not at the beginning. Everybody loves the beginning. And no, not towards the end. Anyone can find the strength when the adrenaline is pumping and the finish line is in sight. I'm talking about the middle that dreaded space 
Brian Moran's Valley of Despair, Jim Rohn's Winter, when nothing around you is reassuring, and I don't mean in some metaphysical way. I mean when you're just not winning. And no winning means no validation, at least not right now, and no immediate validation means you begin to question things, question the work, the initiative, your ability to carry it out. See, I've come to form an important bond with this place every time I wander in its direction. It's where lives truly change. So long as you can get beyond that first trap, that trap of thinking that it's a reflection of you, as opposed to what it really is, the test that guards and protects the realm of excellence, the invitation to become who you've never been. There's a saying that everything looks like failure in the middle. It's one's ability to see through that haze that eventually makes the middle something meaningful. That obligation not to stop, not to let the external world do internal damage. The obligation to depersonalize the bumps along the road, the people in your way. The chaos, the difficulty, the uncertainty, it's not about you. It's about everyone trying to figure life out. Trying everything and looking everywhere but the road in front of them. Your job is not to leap a mile or change humanity with a single act. No, it's to carry on. And don't discourage yourself by thinking you owe more than that. Because all you can do in a single moment is not stop. I've always said one of the most beautiful things about victory is that no matter how big, it can be simplified, condensed down to those who could have said no, but didn't. And that when your plan is to show up no matter what, you have made yourself elite. You've built a template for the results to model, to catch up. You're there. When you win and when you lose, when you're excited and when you feel tired, when you're certain, and when you have no clue, you are there. That is your obligation. And when those steps, when those decisions, when that persistence comes together, they tell a story so incredible that we can't help but stop and admire the result. One decision at a time, without seeing it in the moment, has come to be something larger than life. Saying yes once, it likely doesn't mean much, but saying yes in the face of adversity every day recreates your world. So stay true to your obligation. Whether you're in the valley of despair, winter, or some other hellscape we refer to as the middle, remember that an ending is not required of you, no, not right now. All that is asked is that you don't stop, that you see hope when so many are unwilling, that you see the temporary nature of the state you're in and believe with all your heart that you'll emerge victorious. One simple decision at a time. Sometimes we have to hear no 99 times before we can get to our yes. Sometimes we have to repeatedly fall before we can stand our ground. But here's the beauty in all that. It doesn't matter how many times you fall or how many no's you get. It only takes one yes for things to change, to turn around. You only need that one door to open for you. It's very easy to get caught up in the negative, the locked doors and the rejections, but they are not the problem. They're part of the process. They're what we have to go through to get to our destination. And one of the greatest things you can do for yourself and your goals is to depersonalize these locked doors 
They're not the world working against you. They are the world working for you, bringing you one step closer to the path that you need to take. Don't stop at door one or two or 50. Stop when you've gotten the answer you're seeking. Eight lessons to live by. Number one, remind yourself to see those things we've taught ourselves not to see. The things that don't directly correlate to money or status or ascension up some social hierarchy, underneath those things are what keeps us alive. Keep our souls lit, our eyes open, our days meaningful. We don't think we need music to invigorate the soul. We don't think we need wind on our face or sand on our feet. We don't think we need to shut the world off so we can hear ourselves think. Now we fall into the trap of believing that beautiful is a luxury. It's not. It's why we're here. And it's not about being anti-money or status or whatever your goals are. But it is about realizing that those things without beauty and art and nature and calm are empty. There are plain without wings, lungs without air. The things we have taught ourselves not to see are the things we need above all else. Number two, you are stronger than you think you are. You are made to endure, to pave a path, find a way, rise to the occasion. And we know this when it's easy, but we forget when it's not when the world feels stacked against us, when you're writing things no one reads, saying things no one hears, making things no one sees, when you know you have somewhere to go but aren't sure where that is, know you need to evolve into something but have no idea what, this is when you need to know that you have everything you need. It's not about finding new pieces. It's about arranging the ones in your hand. Like smoke expands to fill any room, your potential can expand to conquer any obstacle. You are stronger than you think you are. Number three, some things are beyond our control. But being ready for the opportunity when it comes our way is very much in our control. And maybe it takes a day, a month, a year, longer, you can't control that. You can't control the path of that firefly, but when it lights up and comes your way, you can have the jar ready and the lid off. You can be well-read, well-prepared, rehearsed to the point of confidence, reliance on repetition and not hope. No endeavor is a coin flip when you use a double-headed quarter. One of the most valuable questions I've learned to ask is when and where in my life can I create those magic coins? Number four, we are at our best when we are moving towards something. Inaction has an opportunity cost that is more expensive than anyone wants to pay. Places I haven't gone, risks I haven't taken, they're the loss. The dragon has the gold for a reason, and to avoid the former is to forfeit the latter. If we are not growing, we are dying. So as Emerson suggested, find a star to hitch your wagon to. And even when the world forces detours upon you, inserts roadblocks, or temporarily covers that star up altogether, remember that it's still there 
shining as bright as it ever has, waiting for you to reorient yourself, remember who you are, and carry on. Number five, when it's your fault, you are in control. I used to hide behind the notion that bad grades were because of a bad teacher, that missing the promotion was because of the boss, that an inability to influence was because the world didn't understand. And to whatever degree these things may be true, we win when we dial them back to zero. If your bad grades are completely your fault, you'll better prepare. If your lack of promotion falls entirely on your shoulders, you'll find ways to add more value. If your inability to influence is because you're missing the mark, you'll stop projecting yourself onto the world and start asking the world how you can serve. Before it can become an opportunity, it has to first become your responsibility. To grow, we have to plant roots where it hurts, where the ego lives, where we have to first be humbled. Then we can accelerate vertically. Number six, if it means something to you, there is value. It's not stupid. Just because they don't get it doesn't mean that they shouldn't. Just because it's not happening today doesn't mean it won't be tomorrow. You know, life is a lot like six-year-olds playing soccer. Everyone chases the ball because that's what we're told. That's where the attention is. That's what's flashy. But as an outside midfielder most of my life, I know that some of the most potent attack sequences manifest on the outside of the field and then are recentered. To run up the sideline without the ball is to see what happens before it happens. The magic is created in the empty space before it translates to the high traffic, high reward areas. And just because you're metaphorically running without the ball doesn't mean you're not in prime position to have monumental impact. You're not reacting, you are creating. Don't forget that. Number seven, nothing is mandatory. Everything we do, we choose. Where we are, who we're with, how we spend our time. And it's easy to look around and think we are programmed to exist between specific parameters. We're not. And often we don't see until life forces a change upon us how much flexibility we have in life. Now sure, change obviously brings with it its challenges. New questions, uncertainties, new places to map and people to meet, but as Mark Manson says, there is no problem-free life. No, the beauty of life is that we get to choose which problems we will spend our time solving. Problems to solve are what make life meaningful. So if you're looking around and not seeing what you want to see, you're not stuck. You're simply solving the wrong problems. Perhaps it's time to find some new ones. And number eight, tomorrow is not your answer. It's your problem. Tomorrow is your excuse to wait, to hold off, to rationalize stagnation. Tomorrow is the status quo. It's a fresh new coat of paint on a car that won't run, or a new roof on a house with a cracked foundation. Tomorrow can only tell the story that is acted out today. That means without stepping into the limelight right now, in the immediate, in the present, there will be no story. Because stories aren't made tomorrow, they're made now. So let's stop expecting the messenger to be the author. And let's take fate into our own hands, write our own headlines during the only moment we'll ever have, the present one. So let the rest of the world dance around tomorrow. That's not where your mind should be. You should be working on the melody of today. <laughs>